conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Good evening. My name is Janice Laflan, and I am a uh, an actor that works on conversations across time with host Vivian Crawford. And this evening we are going to continue our conversation with our esteemed guests, Lyndon Baines Johnson, President of the United States, slave, gladiator, and free man, Spartacus, and Queen Esther, only one of two women who have books written about them in the Bible. They will continue the conversation that began weeks ago on the effort and obstacles to overcome oppression in each of their cultures. Enjoy the show. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Conversations Across Time, the television show that allows you, the viewer, to imagine or to view imaginary conversations between persons from different historical times. And um, we strive to bring some interesting combinations to you. And tonight, uh, let me begin by saying that my co-host, Babette Josephs, who's normally here, is on assignment. And so sitting uh, in the co-host chair tonight is our historian, uh, Mr. Mark Hoffman. Many of you know Mark from the times that he's appeared in various roles as Oliver Wendell Holmes, as Charles de Gaulle, as uh, he's just been here a lot. And so I, I'd like you to, uh, I want you, the audience, to know how excited we are to have Mark sitting here as co-host. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me, and I have very large shoes to fill. I look forward to our conversation. Sitting next to uh, Mark is a guest who was here last week, and we invited him back, and that is uh, Spartacus. I identified Spartacus before as a, a general, and I was corrected on that, but uh, Spartacus, as you know, was a gladiator, slave, and warrior against the Roman Empire. I thank you so much for rejoining us, General, Sp I'm sorry, Mr. Spartacus. Seated next to Spartacus is uh, Queen Esther. Queen Esther became the queen of Persia in 478 BCE. And uh, she was 14 years old when she became queen. She's actually credited with saving the Jewish people from a massacre, which was planned by Haman, who was the prime minister to the king of Persia. And thank you so much for joining us again, Queen Esther. Thank you kindly for having me. And uh, seated next to Queen Esther is President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, president Johnson was the 36th President of the United States, and as many of you know, he became President uh, on November 22nd, 1963, and the reason that that is so etched in my memory is because that is the day that uh, his predecessor, President John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. Welcome, President Johnson. Pleasure to be here, ma'am. Now, um, our conversation tonight is a continuation of what we talked about that last week, or and the week before that, having to do with oppression. And um, in, in their own ways, all of our guests participated in the relief, or at least the attempt to relieve oppression. And uh, I, I want to get to you, President Johnson, because in our two previous conversations, we've not had an opportunity to tackle something that I believe is uh, most interesting, and I really think that uh, it's time for us to ask you some serious questions. First of all, uh, I recognize the impo your importance in history, because you did a, an awful lot for poor people and oppressed people in, in this country. There's absolutely no question that the amount of legislation that happened not only during your presidency, but the amount of legislation you did when you were in the Senate and when you were in, uh, in, in the House of Representatives. It's just, in, today when I look at Congress and realize everything that you did, it's just amazing. 
So I want to start with asking you about the war in Vietnam. I, I think we need to discuss that. I know it's probably a very ticklish subject for you, but uh, I want to know, let's start off with this basic question, and that is, did you delegate the war in Vietnam to the U.S. military because you were more interested in domestic policy? Well, ma'am, I, I didn't quite, do, do, how shall I say it, delegate the, uh, the war effort to the generals in the field. I did, I might have, but I did take an interest in the, in the conduct of the war from the White House and the situation room in the White House, put, put plainly. I did monitor the progress of the war as best I could from the, from the situation room and and the reason I was so interested in the war, man, was because I, I was, the thinking in, in that time in the government was that the Soviet Union was uh, considered to be behind every form of insurgency in the third world, in Asia and in, in Cuba. Uh, Cuba was a particular sore spot uh, for our foreign policy thinking. We were afraid that uh, that Castro in Cuba would establish Cuba as a base for spreading communist subversion uh, throughout uh, Latin America, and and we, our thinking in uh, Asia was dominated by the domino theory. The idea was that it which was sounds like a neoconservative position, but I'm sorry, go on. Our thinking, the traditional thinking, in uh, in foreign policy at that time, among liberal and conservative thinkers at that time, was that if uh, South Vietnam was to fall to the communists, then other regime uh, states in the area, such as Cambodia and Laos and Thailand and the Philippines, would also be susceptible to a uh, communist takeover. And we wanted to present to the people of Vietnam a viable alternative to, to a communist state. President, President Johnson, I, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for those viewers that watch this show regularly, you may recall, and of course uh, Mark is seated here and he actually played General de Gaulle, and, and you know, we had a very intense discussion about the presence of the United States, the, the presence of France in Vietnam. I think it was a myth. This, this boogeyman of communism was actually a myth. But uh, so when you say that there was going to be a domino effect, you see, you're known for Vietnam. I, as an African-American person, applaud all of the legislative things that you were able to do. The, your great society, the, the war on poverty, Medicare, I mean, there's so many wonderful things that happened during your administration, and it seems to me that at some point, you probably made some bargains with the devil in terms of what you did in order to get your legislation through. That, that, that's a question that, that has not been fully answered. I think that's, uh, Ms. Crawford wants to know, how were you able to get the civil rights left legislation through with the Southern senators? How were you able to get the war on poverty passed in Congress? What methods did you use? And we know you're a, a great politician and you, you had some uh, devious methods. Yes, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, <coughs> ma I'm afraid, uh, Ms. Crawford. <laughs> 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 to be quite blunt, ma'am, uh, as, as a political operator, I, I happen to have, have be familiar with the uh, weaknesses of some of the other political figures in Washington, like... Uh, weaknesses, when you say weaknesses... Such as... You such mean you, mean you spied on them and used J. Edgar Hoover to spy on them to get the goods on them so you could blackmail them, right, President Johnson? That is correct, so <laughs> our idea... <laughs> that is Black definitely... Mail. Yes, uh, yes, Ms. Crawford, that is definitely how I was able to persuade, to put up Mali, uh, other senators, other members of Congress, to uh, see things my way in, in passing the legislation that became known as the Great Society. And I must say that 
My uh, tactics could have been considered ruthless and rather underhanded, but I must say, it, I did it for a worthy cause. Okay, let me. What let was me. your famous saying about how you <laughs> blackmailed and held these people up to get them to pass your legislation? What What did you say? I remember Tell the I audience. Used the time, I remember the time I used a phrase. Yeah, go ahead. I want the man to kiss my ass in Macy's window at high noon and tell me it smells like roses. I want his pecker in my pocket. Okay. And so now we know your political philosophy. Everything. Yes, uh, okay. and I must say that is how I was able to accomplish uh, the Great Society and the space program in Washington by finding out the, shall we say, weak spot or peccadillos of these of the various senators and House members. Now, let, I just I want to ask you this question because we, we often hear about J. Edgar Hoover and the fact that he had files on so many people. He did, madam. It, it seems to me that you and J. Edgar Hoover might have had a very symbiotic relationship if you were using the FBI to collect uh, materials on uh, people that would that you would need to pass your legislation. Did you just collect this material and and? even if, if it was not that you were going to use it, but you just had it in your pocket? And how much, how many he legislators had, did you have? Well, I won't say uh, definitely how many uh, legislators I, I had information on, but I knew that Mr. Hoover had his own, shall we say, agenda, in that uh, he used that information for it on the members of Congress for his own benefit to, to uh, uh, get money from members of Congress for the uh, for the FBI and to maintain himself in in office as director of the FBI. And please remember that Mr. Hoover State remained in office as director of the FBI for I would say five decades. Yes, and we know how powerful he was. Uh, I, this is what I'm not clear on, it, and and perhaps you can help me. So you, you use the FBI to collect material on members of Congress for your purposes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hoover used that information for his purposes. That is most definitely true. Did you true. two ever plan together? Did you collude or was this just something that you were each doing, separate and apart, but you each knew that the other one was doing it? Well, I had my purposes for the information and Mr. Hoover had his purposes for the information. President Johnson. But it's, uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Therefore, we did not consciously have this collusion or agreement, but suffice it to say, it did work out well for, the, for each of us. Now, I, I suppose when we ask you about your legacy, your legacy is, is, is often remembered as Vietnam. Yes, it is unfortunate. I was very confident, madam, in the ability to, of our government and, its, and our economy and its prosperity to get across the, uh, fulfill the promise of the Great Society and to uh, maintain a strong uh, military presence in Vietnam and maintain the space program, which is one of, another one of my uh, legacies of which I am proud of, in which I have fulfilled, we were able to fulfill uh, President Kennedy's dream of putting a man on the moon uh, before the end of the decade. That was his goal, and I supported it wholeheartedly. Uh, yes, but getting back to Vietnam, I was quite confident in our government's ability to sustain a viable government uh, in South Vietnam, in Saigon, that would serve as an alternative to a communist regime, and quite frankly, from all indications, the... But in yes. hindsight, I mean, when yes. you look at your position in talking about communism, and we've had uh, opportunity on this show, as I said, to have discussion with, uh, uh, <laughs> with John Foster Dulles, uh, with President de Gaulle. And one thing that's very clear now is that communism was not what was going on in Vietnam necessarily. The Vietnamese were interested in not having Western influence. They didn't want the French, they didn't want the United States, and they also didn't want the Russians. 
They wanted to chart their own destiny, much like the Jews in Persia during Queen Esther's period and the slaves in Rome during Sparta. I mean, that's, that's the similarity that, that is why this panel discussion comes about. Because when we spoke last, what Spartacus indicated is that they didn't have a higher goal, they just wanted to be free. Uh, Queen Esther, the, the, as representing the, the Jews were oppressed in Persia. Everywhere else. Okay. But, but <coughs> presumably, there was no other ism that you were interested in other than freedom. That is correct, yes. Freedom of religion. That's correct. And, and that's what happened in Vietnam. I mean, the United States got it wrong. And, and, and Charles de Gaulle tried to warn you that you were getting it wrong. That the, so I, Vietnam is, 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 because I'm from that generation and I protested the war, and Vietnam is still something that's not been settled in terms of historically how we view that. Yes, I agree, Madam Ms. Crawford. In, our th in the thinking of our government, we viewed uh, communism as this worldwide monolithic movement. And we've, in hindsight, see that it was not so. The Russian communists had their uh, interests, and the Chinese communists had their interests, and the Cuban communists had their interests, and the Viet definitely the Vietnamese communists had their interests, and it is apparently that among these nations, uh, the national interest uh, superseded whatever ide ideology or belief system they expounded. President Johnson, I posed a question to you uh, when you said we, and you were talking about what the United States felt. And I, I'd like to know who the we is, because as we know, we, we have tonight, we, we have Spartacus. Uh, Spartacus was a part of uh, a, a large slave population in Rome that actually the, the military was run by the wealthy people and for the benefit of the wealthy people. I, I guess when I hear you say we, when you're talking about the United States, it makes me wonder exactly who we is because the, the history has shown us the Vietnam War didn't profit us anything. We is always the wealthiest. That's the only we that history pays any attention to as history is being made. After it happens, occasionally someone will examine what happened to those who were not in the wealthiest class, but only people that matter in any time are the people who ha have swords or money or both. I would agree, Mr. Spartacus, Ms. Uh, Crawford. In retrospect, I have realized that there had become a sort of, shall we say, disassociation uh, between uh, the government of the United States and the people of the United States. Our, our government uh, was primarily populated in the upper echelons by uh, persons uh, taken from corporations such as my defense secretary, Robert McNamara, who was the president of the Ford Motor Company. And we were, in my administration, we were confident that uh, men of Mr. McNamara's caliber, who knew how to run corporations efficiently, could run such a big enterprise as the federal government. Uh, president Johnson, yes, I don't sir. mean to interrupt you. I think what Ms. Crawford is saying is, if you declare a war on poverty, Yes, sir. And you know enough economics to know you cannot fight a war on poverty and use the resources for that and also fight a war in Vietnam because I'm sure you studied economics and you have economic advisors that talk about guns and butter. You can't have both. And you're going on about the upper class and your military advisors. Don't you regret the treasure? Or, or do you regret it? Do yeah. you? That's right. Do you regret not winning the war on poverty by pursuing the war in Vietnam. Yes, sir, I most certainly uh, do regret the fact that I was not able to fulfill the, uh, the war on poverty be 
to be able to pay for it. Every but and, would and, that have every uh, every would that ever have been possible though with uh, a, a war on poverty is a wonderful idea, but between guns and butter, the thing that I it's clear we're forgetting is that who has both. So to say that a war on poverty couldn't be fought at the same time that a war of attrition is being fought suggests that resources are insufficient to support both and that's simply not true. Well, if you look oh, at yes, his, it is, it is true. If you look at if you look at, at most of of the last few hundred years of recorded history, what you see with poor people is poor people suffering not because there isn't enough to go around, but because they just don't have access to it. It's not allocated correctly. And if you allocate it to the military, <laughs> you can't allocate it to social programs. And I that's, must point that, out, point. ladies and gentlemen, that there has been this long-standing attitude in, my, uh, in this country, which uh, I, I confess that I have been susceptible to, known as American exceptionalism. It was the idea that exceptionalism being that that, you could that we that we could have uh, a vast military apparatus and pay for the war on poverty and pay for the space program, which I helped also bring about. I, however, I, I, it was excuse me, please, ma'am. It was during the latter part of my administration that I had to sacrifice. Uh, you had to sacrifice the poor people for the for the military industrial complex. That is correct, madam. I had to uh, and I was space. Sacrifice, you space. I had to sacrifice and space, yes. I had to sacrifice uh, the programs of the Great Society uh, to pay for the the pay for the war effort in Vietnam. And Which was an unwinnable I, war. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't interrupt you, but it's an un, it was an unwinnable proposition from the beginning. But please, go with on. All the, I must interrupt at this point. Yes, with all these sacrifices that you say or call upon, aren't you missing the main point? You're putting all these people and society into jeopardy with everything that you're saying you're sacrificing. What is the main point? I'm just quite confused. It's... It has, uh, in retrospect, madam, you are correct. We, I think, I, what she's trying to say, President Johnson, <laughs> is that your ego was so big. Maybe it was all the peckers in his pocket. I was just going to say that, Spartacus. <laughs> could have been. Anyway, could have been. That, anyway, <laughs> that you thought you could do everything, and you can't. And you had economic advisors that told you you could not have the war, have the space program. We don't, nobody has that kind of resources. Never, nowhere, anyhow. But your ego, that's what it was. You were an egomaniac, and I'm charging you with that. Yes, I would agree, sir. Uh, oh, plus thank I you. Was <laughs> Wait a minute, you agree that you were an egomaniac. I mean, because well, you accomplished how, some great ma things. Ma'am, that is how you get things done, by I, being, all right. being confident. I agree. I call uh, it confidence. And you also, and, you and Bris confidence, uh, that is how I, you get things accomplished in Washington by projecting a confident air and surrounding yourself with like-minded persons who uh, who know your the what you, you have to do, with who know what you have to do like and what person. you have I, to... I know, and you know what's interesting, you know what's interesting, President Johnson? Yes, the sir. people that you surrounded yourself with had no interest in the great society. But they it had feels bodies. That way. Yes, I, I have been in touch with uh, a, a uh, cadre of foreign policy ad advisors, commonly known as the wise men, such as George Keenan and McGeorge Bundy in my administration. And uh, alas, they advised me to continue on with the war in Vietnam. All out of the John Foster Dulles School. So, so yes. even, yeah. though, yes, even though we have the programs, and some of the programs are very good, and they act as a safety net now, what you're really saying is, President Johnson, it was a sham. It was a, 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 a dupe to the American people to prevent the cities from blowing up and present, uh, mm -hmm. prevent Re yeah. rebellion in the country so it was it was really a sham and your advisors told you the war was more important than the war on poverty or domestic policy. Let us not forget, let us not forget 
I this is from, important that that there were there were civil uprisings yes, there in was. Detroit, in Los Angeles, the Watts riots, in Philadelphia. I believe that when you're referring to civil unrest, the proper pronunciation is Detroit. Detroit. <laughs> so in Detroit. How do you know that, Spartacus? I've been reading in preparation for this show. <laughs> But, but so there, there, were, there were civil uprisings that were happening around, all over the country. And I submit to you that your great society, I, I, I think you were sincere, I think you wanted to do something. But I believe that those people that you surrounded yourself with had no interest and all they, all they really wanted to do was to make certain that this country didn't blow up because we well, were headed now towards- Now let's be fair, that, that constitutes like-mindedness, wouldn't you agree? Well, I don't know, and I'll tell you why. Only because President Johnson may have had this notion about doing good things for the great society. At the same time, the people that he surrounded himself with were people who were making money from the war. We they, have all made, we have all now Everybody made, except poor people makes money from war. It, it we have true, all man, made I'm, bargains with people who we at some, in some way found distasteful in order to achieve some greater end, at least greater in our own perception. So to say that the people whom the president surrounded himself with were not like-minded is perhaps just so obvious as to not be worth mentioning because the point, greater point that you made, which is to stop the country or prevent the country from blowing up any further than it already did, even the most, all but the, the most revolutionary minded would suggest that domestic tranquility is a goal worth making some ideological sacrifices for. My belief, uh, ladies and gentlemen, was that we, we were trying to prevent civil unrest, as you have stated, Mr. Spartacus, and, but we were also, our primary goal was to give low income and poor people the opportunity to advance themselves, to utilize their talents, to improve their lives, uh, with such programs as Medicare and Medicaid, which were based around- Great programs all, no question. Yes, and, uh, and housing and urban development, I, and improving education, and uh, the food stamp program. Those, those policies, I am proud to say, uh, may not have totally e eliminated poverty, but they kept it from getting worse, and I must say they were helpful in uh, helping low-income people to, shall we say, uh, survive to, to attain a job. The greatest problem with the Great Society is that it was not completed. Just like any exactly. task in any political administration, the hardest part is not making the change, but making the change permanent. And the great society made some improvements, but not enough improvements for the great society to last long enough for it still to be called a great society. And, 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 and on that note, I am, uh, because we, we, we've gotten into an area that I, I'd like us to be able to continue to discuss, so I, I'm gonna ask if, if the panel would come back next week, because I, I do still need to hear from you, President Johnson, um, as to how you feel, and or whether or not you feel that the, your period in the office of presidency accomplished everything that you wanted it to, and in hindsight, could you have accomplished more? I, I, I'd, I'd like to hear that because there needs to be some, at least intellectual closure to the 
notion that perhaps you were the supreme Machiavellian and manipulator that you are known to be. Perhaps you had been somewhat manipulated yourself, but that is uh, another question for uh, another episode, and I will please ask that you will return and we can take up this conversation again next week. This has been Conversations Across Time. Thank you so much for joining us.